All right, in our last lesson, we finished the section of Genesis that explained the fall of man. So very briefly, we saw last week, God sets forth His command. To obey the command is life. To disobey the command brings death and all of the things of death. We said, of course, as we reviewed what had taken place, that man disobeyed and suffered the various consequences of death. Death isn't just like, oh, you know, all of a sudden you have a heart attack or something and you die. Death has all kinds of consequences while you're alive. It's like living death, you know? uh, sorrow and pain and alienation from the environment. You know, that's why he had to work. Adam would now have to work and to draw his life from the uh, from the environment, uh, and of course the final decomposition of his body when his soul leaves his body. In essence, the word death, that's what it means. It means separation, actually. The soul from the body. The second death is this, the eternal separation of the soul from, from God. Okay? So those are the, um, uh, those are the effects of, of death. And we also saw that God offers a glimpse of the salvation to come and we see Adam and Eve respond to the hope that God sets before them. Um, they begin to have children. Isn't that strange? We talked about that. You know, their response of faith was that they would have children. They would actually multiply and fill the earth because God promised that the salvation, the seed, the hope would come through their uh, generations. Uh, and so they begin to have children, which is a sign that they believe God's promise that salvation will come, as I mentioned, through a human form in the future. Uh, and they are removed from the garden to live out their lives again, away from the presence of God. Now the next uh, section um, describes the beginning of the fall of the world now inhabited by sinful men. And so we begin by the murder of Abel. As we discussed earlier, the fact that Eve had children despite the suffering that would come with childbirth is a sign that she, along with Adam, believed the promise of God to send a savior through her seed. And her response is, despite the pain, despite the difficulty, she uh, you know, uh, agreed, I don't know if the word agreed is good, but uh, she and, and Adam began to obey God's command to multiply. They didn't obey the first command. You know, the first command was don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was the first command, don't do that. And they went ahead and did that. And then the other command was go ahead and fill, you know, multiply, fill the earth. That's the other command. Well, then they went ahead and filled that command. And it seems throughout history, man has never had trouble filling that particular commandment as we have seen here in Genesis. Now we're going to see, however, that Satan's initial attempt to control the woman and to dominate her seed will continue to the next generation and result in the poisoning of one child and the death of another. The battle is still on between Satan and the seed of woman. He hasn't given up. So the seed of Satan will murder the seed of woman in an attempt to continue to dominate. But God will continue the seed with other children. Okay? Yet another image of the ultimate scenario of the death and the resurrection of Christ. One possible seed of the future is killed and God raises up another one. Always the regenerating power that God demonstrates not only in the, in the physical creation, but through humanity as well. So uh, we uh, begin with verse one, chapter four, verse one. It says, now the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain, and she said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. Now some of the versions of, in your Bibles have the word Adam knew Eve. All right, some of the older versions have that. And the word know there, or to know in the Hebrew, is a euphemism for sexual intimacy and the transparency in marital love. Interesting that the name uh, Cain uh, means gotten in reference to the fact that Eve uh, was joyful that she was able to beget or to bear a child. 
remember now, we're looking at it from the future and we're looking back, you know, to hindsight's 2020, so we're looking back at the events, but they, you know, they had no idea of the future, so, so she obeys God. They have a child. She's rejoicing, hey, I've got this child, Cain, you know, God said the promise would come through my seed and now I, we have a child, Cain. So it would be understandable to surmise that she may have thought, this, here it is, right here, he's the one who's going to fulfill the promise. Just like you know, in the New Testament, the apostles, the early disciples, they thought Jesus was coming back like right away, you know, it won't be long now. They didn't know that it could be a century or a millennium or 10 millennia, they didn't know that. So in the same way, she didn't know. It's significant to note that the first human created was a man, the first human conceived was a man, and the first human resurrected to eternal life was also in a man's body. Eve's joy may have also been based on the fact, as I mentioned, that she thought that this person, Cain, might be the deliverer. He's the one, he's the savior, he's the seed. Okay, so let's read verse two. It says, again she gave birth to his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Again, interesting to note that Abel's name means vapor, vanity. There could be several reasons for this. Perhaps Eve began to experience the results of sin in her life and saw what God meant by the curse. Remember, they're perfect, they sin, God, God curses, tells them what's going to happen, but did it happen like right away? Remember I told you the example of the branch? You cut yourself away from God, like if it's a branch, does that branch turn yellow and the leaves begin to turn brown, the fruit begin to rot immediately? No, at first, it looks like everything's okay. It's with time that you see, oh, the tree's still growing and the branches connected to the tree are still alive and the branch cut away. Uh oh, now we begin to see. Well, the same thing with Eve. You know, maybe right away the curse wasn't evident, but with time she begins to see the effect of sin in her life. Perhaps Cain began to demonstrate sinful tendencies and Eve recognizes the vanity or the shortness of a life with death as its natural end and gives a name to a child that expresses that feeling. Or she could have been predicting the shortness of Abel's life, who knows? You know, those of us who are parents, don't you kind of know your kids? Have you not said in your own mind, maybe you haven't said it to them, but as you're speaking with your spouse, you know, you're talking about one of the children, you're saying, well, I don't know about that boy, or I don't know about that girl. I mean, they keep doing what they're doing here. It hasn't happened yet, but I kind of see where this is going, right? We've all had that experience, those of us who've raised children. Who says she didn't have that experience? Certainly she was insightful. So in chapter five, verse four, it says that Adam and Eve had other sons and other daughters. After all, their role was to populate the earth. And so they continued to have children who themselves had children and, and intermarry. And that brings up another question, always a question about this. Wow, you know, that's against the law. That's even physically, you know, genetically dangerous. You know, brothers marrying sisters, they're actually laws on the books. What is it, you can't marry your first cousin or your third cousin? Is it different from state to state? Oh, there's a joke there, but <laughs> I'm not going to make it. <laughs> but we have laws on the book because we can prove that you know, it's, it's dangerous to, 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 to have people related too closely together to have children together. They can have children together, but it can be a, an unfortunate experience. The children themselves can be born with serious birth defects, you know, even to this day. But, at this time, this was not the case. This, you know, not intermarrying, this becomes forbidden later on in history, again, because of social and physical reasons, but in this situation, before the flood, it was neither dangerous nor was it against God's will. It was the only way to populate the world. And in many closed societies, you know, I'm not talking about like 
England or France, I'm saying closed societies, tribal societies, there was a lot of intermarrying, even to this day, a lot of intermarrying, people marrying their cousins and so on and so forth. Now, this was how Cain and others began families. Now the Bible mentions the occupations of each one of them. Abel was a shepherd since sheep were needed to provide two things at that time. Number one, clothing. Clothing, they needed clothing. Skins, the very first animal killed by God to provide them clothing to cover themselves, and they continued to need clothing, continued to use animals for that, and also they needed animals for sacrifice. Now, we don't have direct instructions in Genesis, but obviously animal sacrifice was being practiced at that time, and the example of sacrificial death was established by God when He provided for Adam and Eve's coverings when they left the garden. So they had a, an example of God doing it, and they continued animal sacrifice, a very, very old uh, ritual. And it was the primary form of worship from the very beginning. Some people wonder, where did the Jews get that? Are they the ones that invented that? No, Jews didn't invent that. And they weren't the only ones who practiced it. Many cultures practiced animal sac sacrifice. In the Jewish faith, however, the sacrifice had a certain meaning that pointed to Christ that was not present in other religions, if you, know what I, if you know what I mean. And Cain uh, was a farmer, like his father. His father was a farmer. And this was necessary because until this time, the produce from the ground was the only form of food that was authorized. I mean, it's only when we get to Genesis chapter 9, verse 3, that God authorizes the use of animals for food. But before the flood, Animals had not been authorized to be eaten. Before this, God authorizes only the use of fruits and vegetables and so on and so forth. And we read this repeatedly in Genesis chapter 1, verse 29, chapter 2, verse 16, chapter 3, verse 19, that He says, all the trees and all the fruits and all the vegetables and the, the you know, this is all, He says, I give this to you for food. Go ahead, eat. But He doesn't say animals, animals for sacrifice for worship, for clothing. When we get to Genesis 9, we'll, we'll see how and why that the eating of meat then becomes necessary. Now, we don't have a time frame here for the events that take place. You know, centuries could have gone by as the population grew and society developed. We, you know, we read in one chapter and we think, oh, this is all happening in a day. But people before the flood lived long, long time. They lived for centuries, seven, eight, nine centuries long. And I remember watching somebody in a video <laughs> demonstrate the math once. You know, statisticians tell us that if, um, let's see, Statisticians tell us that if people were healthy and had normal amounts of children for extended periods, which they did, we're talking about centuries here, then the population would be approximately maybe 150, 200,000 people in the time of Cain. I mean, I know that, you know, two years ago I didn't have any, you know, two, a couple of years ago I had hardly any grandkids, now I got nine. So imagine in this fallen world and so on and so forth, if your family can multiply that fast, can you imagine in a world uh, you know, just at that point, before the flood, people had large families. The, the, the problem is you know, that when we talk about this in our context, we're talking about a period of time and a world that is so foreign to ours. It's like Mars, you know? it's like another planet. Before the flood, things were so different. It kind of stretches our, credit, you know, our, 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 our imagination to imagine that someone could live that long. But is it impossible for God to create a being that could live a thousand years? Well, no. I mean, if He can say, let there be light and there's the sun, and then, you know, and then He puts the lights in the skies and there are millions of planets and stars and so on and so forth, you know, is it that more difficult to create a human being that can live a thousand years, two thousand years? No, nothing's impossible with God. The difficult part is for us to imagine that because we only live for, what, 80 years or so. 
Now we don't have a time frame, as I say, for these events. Centuries could have gone by and society developed. The Bible only traces the life of key persons at the beginning of time. It doesn't trace the life of all other individuals or even societies. I'm sure that certain societies and peoples and tribes and, you know, raised up and, and were destroyed and so that we don't even know about. So the Bible you know, takes one thread and it just follows that one thread through history and that's the Jewish people. All right. So in this section it describes key events and moments in the lives of Cain and Abel, just these two, without reference to time, without reference to social development. So let's read the passage here in chapter four, verses three to five. It says, so it came about in the course of time, see, in the course of time, a year, six months, 200 years, in the course of time, that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and for his offering he had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. So there could be various ways of interpreting these verses. For example, it could be the first time that they actually offered a sacrifice one did with the fruit of the ground and the other with animals. That could be the interpretation. Or it could be that originally only animal sacrifices were offered by everyone, but one day Cain decided to offer something different. He decided to offer fruit and vegetables, the produce of the ground. It could, you, could, you, know, you could interpret it that way. Or, uh, it could be that these kinds of sacrifices were always offered. Animal sacrifices, sacrifices of the fruit and vegetables of you know, produce. Could be that these sacrifices were normal, but there was something in Cain's attitude that changed. It could be that as well. Either way, uh, either way that you look at it, the end result is the same. God was pleased with one, and he was displeased with the other. You know, I used to think that God was displeased with Cain's attitude only. I used to think that way back. And others thought that God disliked the offering only. You know, one or the other, didn't like his attitude or didn't like the way he did the sacrifice, like he didn't do it right, the ritual was not okay. You know? But if you look closely, it shows that God had no respect both for Cain and his sacrifice, he didn't like either. Now there are other places in the Bible that comment on this passage and they shed light on why God rejected Cain's offering and was pleased with Abel's offering. So let's look at these. Matthew chapter 23 verse 35 says, so that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. So one thing we find out in the New Testament is that Abel was a righteous man and his was innocent blood that was shed. In other words, he didn't deserve to die. You don't find that out in Genesis. You find that out in Matthew. You know, there, are, there are many uh, you know, Bible teachers, and I agree with them, that say the best commenter on the Bible is the Bible. And here Jesus himself is referring. There's another thing too, you know, when, when people say, oh, you know, Genesis, Genesis is just a myth, you know, so on and so forth. I don't think Jesus himself would be commenting on a myth. I don't think Jesus himself would be you know, basing an argument of something important based on a character or a person in Genesis if Genesis was not historical. Okay? And in these passages, Matthew 23, Jesus is not kind of talking about a parable here where you know, a parable is a story and so on and so forth. Here he is like condemning the Pharisees, you, know, you hypocrites, you vipers, you know, and so on and so forth. And then he goes back to people who were killed, real people, you know, Zechariah, a real person who was murdered, Abel, 
a real person who was murdered, a righteous person who was murdered. All right, another reference to this activity is in Luke chapter 11. Here Luke writes, for this reason also the wisdom of God said, I will send to them prophets and apostles and some of them they will kill and some they will persecute so that the blood of all the prophets shed since the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah who was killed between the altar and the house of God. Yes, I tell you, it shall be charged against this generation. Well here it says, Abel was a prophet. He spoke God's word. You know, he says, I will send to them prophets and apostles. And then he mentions Abel in that category. So Abel spoke God's word. Then if you go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse four, it says, by faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. And so in Hebrews we find out that Abel's sacrifice was better than Cain's because it was offered in faith. So the fact that he was righteous and faithful suggests what and how he was offering, or what and how he was offering sacrifice and that he was doing so in accordance with the will and direction of God. In other words, if your sacrifice is faithful and acceptable to God, it means you've done it the way God wants you to do it, with the attitude that God wants you to have. This also may indicate the reason why Cain's offering was rejected. You know, if this is what's acceptable to God, I guess the opposite is not acceptable to God. In other words, Maybe the reason that Cain's sacrifice was not acceptable is because he himself was not a righteous man and his sacrifice was not in accordance with God's will. Again, we're combing through passages you know, that refer back to this incident to try to kind of put a, a picture together of what you know, the motivation and what took place and so on and so forth. So, God informs Cain and Abel about their respective sacrifices. Maybe Abel, as a prophet, was charged to tell his brother about his sacrifice and his attitude. Did you ever think about that? I mean, there's no description of Abel's reaction, but Cain, but Cain becomes angry. Well, how does he become, why does he become angry? How does he know that his attitude is not good? How does he know that his sacrifice, you know, how does he know? Well, God has always used people you know, his people to talk to other people. Maybe through Abel, he's speaking to Cain and warning him. Now it says here his countenance or his glance, his look, it said, had been high or proud, now it falls. You know, his countenance fell. What does that mean? It means he was puffed up, he was up here, and then his countenance fell. He shrank. Okay. And with it comes anger and resentment. Let's face it, who likes to be told they're wrong? Right? Nobody likes that. So this anger and resentment becomes directed at Abel because he represents all the things lacking in his own life. Righteousness, faith, peace and joy with God. Abel, uh, Abel's got this, he hasn't got it. And imagine the guy who's got it tells you why you don't have it. Oh, oh, oh my, now I'm mad. So we read verse six and seven. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Notice it's only here that God speaks to Cain. And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. So Abel has tried to warn him and now God warns Cain about the danger ahead. And what does he say to him? Number one, he says, face the problem. You're angry, you're depressed. There's a reason for this. Don't just dwell on it, don't just simmer in the emotion. Find out why you feel this way. I ask people, you know, in counseling, they come in, blah, 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 and I ask them, why do you think you're depressed? 
And they come in and say, well, I'm angry. I don't know what's wrong with me. And I asked them, well, why? If you had to take a guess, why would? Because people know themselves the best. How am I supposed to figure out why they do stuff? <laughs> they, they, usually people just are afraid to ask themselves the right questions because they know the right answer will come out. And so God says, face the problem. The problem is you're angry, you're depressed. So, you know, face it, acknowledge it. Number two, as I say, acknowledge the fault. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 12, it says, you know, not as Cain, who was of the evil one and slew his brother, and for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Whoa, now you know what's going on. So the reason he was angry was because God had rejected his sacrifice, but the reason for that was because he had not done well. He had disobeyed. He had done it the wrong way. He had the wrong attitude, whatever. And so he had to face the real issue, not the one you've made up. You know, the made up issue was, oh, God likes Abel better than me. That's the made up issue. Or he's the favorite one. That's the made up issue. Or you know, I can, you know, the parents loved him more. That's the made up issue. Or I never get a break. That's the made up issue. Or life is really tough for me. That's the made up issue. But that's not the real issue. Again, in counseling, the hardest thing is to get people to face the real issue. Sometimes you have to say to the guy, you know, you know, you know what the issue is? The issue is you're a bully or you're dishonest. That's the issue. That's what's driving everybody crazy in your house. You never tell the truth. So God is saying, come on, acknowledge the truth. Face the real issue, not the one you've made up. As I say in 1 John 3, 12 here, we get more insight into what the real issue, his deeds were evil, he was not a good man. And so here's this evil man disobeying God, thinking he can offer a sacrifice and get God's approval. Boy. How many people do that, huh? And then, of course, deal with the sin. Not only had he messed up, but he was about to make a larger mistake because of it. If he didn't rule over sin, you know what? Sin would rule over him. You can't eliminate sin from your life experience. You can't. You're always going to be tempted you're always going to be affected by and you will always be falling into sin one way or another. You know, get used to it. Just a fact of life. But you can contain it and you can mitigate it. If you don't, it will contain you. So how do you deal with that? Well, God is telling him, face the sin issues in your life. My problem is that I am easily tempted to consume whatever. Too much food, too much alcohol, pornography. You know, I'm a consumer and I'm, I'm consuming bad things for me. That's the real issue. You know, face it. You don't have to tell the whole world, but at least tell yourself, <laughs> me and God, and deal with it. Ask for forgiveness. Say to God, yes, God, I am an angry person and I use anger to get my way, and I manipulate others with the threat of my anger. Yes, that's it, that's the problem. Help me, God. I don't even know how to deal with this. Just help me, please. I, I, let me ask you this. Do you think God refuses a prayer like that? You think from heaven God's going to say, nope, sorry, you're on your own. But you can't just ignore sin. All right, let me finish up, last verse. Last verse, come on. All right, it says, so Cain told his Abel, his brother, Abel his brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. What do you think they spoke about that day in the field? Accusations by Cain, perhaps? Abel saying, look, my brother, you can make this right. There are some ancient texts that add a sentence here in this passage that suggests that Cain drew Abel out into the field where no one would see him in order to kill him. In other words, premeditation. It wasn't just his anger boiled over, it was premeditation, I'm going to get rid of this guy. In any event, the sequence of disobedience, unfaithfulness, jealousy, anger, resentment finally leads to murder, just like Jesus says it does in Matthew 5.22. 
If you're angry with your brother in your heart, you've already killed him, you're on the road. So we see the pollution of the created world and society begin with the murder of Abel. Innocent blood is spilled into the ground. So Satan's attack begun with the woman continues as the first seed to have the promise of salvation is killed, Abel, killed. Now, when we read further, we'll find out that Cain's descendants will not call upon the name of God. His descendants will multiply sin. And we'll, we'll see that later on. God, however, will furnish another son to Eve and this line will begin calling upon God and eventually produce a savior. So a couple of really quick last lessons. Number one, sin is in the world and we have to deal with it or it will just overtake us. Don't think that avoidance is the way to deal with sin. You have to deal with it. Number two, God provides us with resources and opportunities to deal with sin. He offered to take Cain back if he did what was right. We fight him off many times because we're mad, we're afraid, or we're ashamed. If we have anger, fear, and shame, ask yourself, who is producing that in your heart? Is that the Lord doing that? The Lord does not produce shame in you, or fear in you, or anger in you. The Lord produces the fruit of the Spirit, joy, peace, patience, so on and so forth. So ask yourself, who's manipulating me here? And then finally, Satan cannot destroy the plan of God. Yes, he killed Abel, but God raised up another seed to take his place. And he'll kill our bodies one day, Satan will, through illness or death, I mean through illness or accident or whatever, but the promise is that God will raise us up so that we will understand and know and experience the final, the final victory. Okay, Cain and Abel, we will move on at our next meeting. Thank you very much.